Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Afterburner. I'm Bill Whittle. The Heritage Foundation recently published a remarkable study on poverty in America. Now, there's one set of graphs in there that you really need to understand, and here they are. This first one is a list of various amenities for all U.S. households. These are the things in percentages that we all have together, rich or poor. Now, right up at the very top, we see that 99.9% .9 of all Americans have refrigerators. 98.7% of Americans own at least one television. 84% have air conditioning. 68% own a computer. 31% have a video game system, all the way down to the bottom amenity, where we learn that only 6% of all Americans own a jacuzzi. Now, that's for all of us, for the whole country, rich and poor. Now, let's take a look at poor America. Not as much of a drop as you thought, huh? Given the rhetoric from the left since, well, forever. Didn't you expect poor Americans' lot to be much, much harder than this? Let's look at them side by side. The chart on the left is what all of America has averaged together, while the chart on the right is for the poorest Americans only. 99.9% .9 of all Americans have refrigerators. 99.6% of poor people do. That's good, obviously. 98.7% of all Americans own a TV, but only 97.7% of America's poor do. Well. They need the television so that the mainstream media can remind them hourly of what a terrible country this is. Air conditioning is down from 84% to 78.3%. Computer ownership falls from about oh, 7 in 10 to 4 in 10. And the video game console, 31% for all Americans, plummets to only 29.3% for the poor. Now, needless to say, this report came under furious attack from guys like Stephen Colbert, who depend on snark or moral outrage to make sure that statistics like this don't sink in, because if they do sink in, it's time to ask ourselves some fundamental questions. Colbert attacked the report by expressing mock outrage that the poor have refrigerators. Hey, if you're a one-trick pony, you better know how to do the trick, right? No one's complaining about the poor having refrigerators. I'm not complaining about the poor having anything, not air conditioning or microwave ovens or multiple TV sets or video game consoles. I believe everyone should be entitled to the fruits of what they earn. The poor having these things is not the issue. But having them in this kind of abundance calls into question the kind of country that Colbert in particular and the Democratic Party in general say that we live in. Here are the households that have air conditioning. All households are the top line, poor households are the line below. But this graph tracks time as well as percentage. Now look at the two left dots. 36% of all households had air conditioning in 1970. 41.2% of poor households had it by 1980. In other words, more poor people had air conditioning in 1980 than the average American did in 1970. And computer ownership shows pretty much the same thing. About 15% of all households had one in 1980 compared to about 5% of the poor. But by 1998 or so, poor Americans had as many computers as all Americans had had only eight years earlier. And by 2005, the percentage of poor households with computers relative to average households with computers had gone from about 30% to about 60%. So as a general rule, poor Americans have most everything that the average American has. They only get it about 10 or 15 years later. You know, if you hadn't been told differently by your moral betters in the mainstream media, a fellow could look at these numbers and come to the conclusion that the rich get richer and the poor get richer too. Now, in a healthy society, we would look at numbers like this and we'd have a parade. Because if we lived in a healthy society, we could look at the fact that while average living space for all Europeans, that is a rich part of the world, is 976 square feet. The average living area for poor Americans is 1,228 square feet. In other words, for every four square feet that the average European has to live in, a poor American has five. In a healthy society, we would dance in the streets to know that while almost 40% of all African children show some sign of malnutrition and almost 50% of Asian kids do, all Asian kids, only 2.6% of all poor Americans, not of all Americans, but only 2.6% of the poorest Americans show any sign of malnutrition. We should have a parade, but we don't, and I know why. See, I've been poor. I've had to decide whether to pay the rent or the power. By the way, you can put off the rent a lot longer than you can live without power. I've looked for drop change below drive through windows at 1 in the morning. I'm 6 foot 1, and for many years of my life, I weighed 119 pounds. I didn't have a TV or a cell phone or heating or air conditioning, and a few times in my life, the first thing I saw when I woke up in the morning was the sight of my own breath in front of my face. So this is not an attack on the poor. I've been there, and it's awful. It is an attack on poor mongers and poor mongering, a shot of perspective 
against using these Dickensian ideas of poverty to grab ever more money and power from that half of the country that pays these benefits and gets nothing in return but ingratitude, contempt, and demands for more and more and more. You see, when I was poor, I asked my friends for help, and they gave me some help. And when they wouldn't give me more help, I got angry with them because they were doing well and I wasn't. For people who've never been there, that is a hard thing to understand, this defect in the human heart. So how can I explain it to you? This is the best I can do. Imagine that you work in a large office building and that you're just one of 100 cubicles up on the 34th floor. And one Friday afternoon, the president of the company shows up and says, John, we've been watching you very closely. Your work has been exemplary. You've been honest, competent, friendly, and on time. So as a small token of our appreciation, we wanted to give you a check for $100,000 tax-free just to thank you for everything you've done for the company. And then he walks off. Now, needless to say, you're filled with unbridled joy. You immediately start to think about all the things that you could do with that money. You could put the kids through college, pay off the house, take a trip around the world. It's all gratitude and it's nothing but win. So you go to tell your coworkers about it and they tell you that the president had come to their desks too. He made the exact same speech, only everybody else didn't get $100,000. They got $300,000, every single one of them. Now what happens? Well, what a moment ago was a blessing and a joy has turned to bitterness and resentment. You no longer think about what you're going to do with $100,000. You only think about what you could have done with $300,000 just like everybody else. And if the deal was that everyone had to take their checks or else no one got them, I'm telling you now, there are people out there that would rather tear up $100,000 than bear to see everyone else get more. It's true and you know it's true. It's envy. That is one of the major flaws in the human heart, and not a person in a hundred is completely free from it. So why the envy over someone else getting that bigger check? Well, I think it's because we know that we didn't earn it. If that person had worked harder and longer than you to make more money, most of us would be okay with that. Not all of us, obviously. That's why we still have a professional left wing in politics, but most of us would understand it. But when it's a gift, the size of the gift translates into the size of our worth which is why the poor in America, by every measure, the richest poor people in the history of the world, and by a wide margin, are generally speaking now, not filled with gratitude for the assistance they get, but rather with envy and hatred for those so-called fat cats who are paying for their food stamps and their subsidized housing. Have you ever once, once, seen a person on assistance publicly thank the people whose extra work made that assistance possible? I haven't. Now, I'm afraid that this is the real poverty in America. It's a poverty of dependency and entitlement. Entire generations now, without any sense of control over their own destiny, stoked mostly by a Democratic Party whose full-time job it is to fan the flames of resentment and envy so that they can buy votes by promising people more of what their neighbor has worked for, because that's what it's come to today, now that half of Americans pay no income tax. It's us versus them. Not millions of the starving masses out on the barricades outside of a handful of powdered fops in the palace at Versailles, but one tax-paying American supporting one who doesn't pay any taxes, standing next to each other in the checkout line at Best Buy.